In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Can we give God a shout of praise? That doesn't sound like a shout. Come on, people. Can we give God a shout of praise? Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Father. Amen. Praise God. You can please be seated. And you may want to welcome someone to your left and right. Say you're welcome. Praise God. You're welcome. You want to say something nice about them. You're looking good. Love your outfit. Glory, 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 glory. Oh, the Holy Ghost is in this house. He's in this house. Hallelujah. Praise God. And he's in this house to manifest himself. <laughs> to show himself. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. That which withers stops right now. It stops right now. Every withering, everything that is withering, it stops right now. It stops right now. Everything that decays, it stops right now. It stops right now. It stops right now. And we speak life in the name of Jesus. We speak life in the name of Jesus. Everything that withers, it stops now. The withering stops now. Can we say that together? The withering stops. One more time. The withering. Yes, it does. For death could not hold him. And if it could not hold him, it can't hold you. It can't hold you. It can't hold you. No appearance of death whatsoever can hold you. It wouldn't hold you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Glory to God. Is, is there by any means someone with a shoulder issue here? Something about the shoulder? Anyone like that? Anyone like that? I don't see any hand. Something about the shoulder. The shoulder. The shoulders. Thank you, Lord. I don't see anyone. I don't see anyone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I don't see anyone, so I'm just going to move on. Praise God. word is going forth in power and in strength. All right. So last week, we looked at the pathway to dishonor. And um, we looked at how in dishonor really starts. Um, it starts primarily by permissiveness you see that urge to just slow things down take things easy make things a little a little more comfortable to to you you know that's really where this harness starts and it's important to take note of that let's go to f that's efficient for samuel First Samuel uh, text for this series, chapter 2 and verse 29 and 30. Well, we can just read verse 30. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. Okay. All right, he says, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house, talking about the house of Eli, and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. 
Can we say that latter part together? Um, for those that honor me, can we say that together? One, two, ready, read. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. How many people believe that this is a very important thing? How many people believe that? Just a few people? Just a few people? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Praise God. <laughs> this is very vital. This is very vital. You know, when I set out, I was telling a few people while I was studying, I had known that we were going to go this direction just recently. We had actually planned something else for the month of October. I had actually planned something else for the month of October and perhaps even got it moving. But then my heart started tilting in another direction and I just chose to follow my heart in that direction, which is to speak on the subject of estimation of the things of God. And this, this cuts across. I have not even scratched the surface just yet. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. While I was doing the study, I remember telling, I think it was Pastor Michael I was telling, that I didn't even know that this thing is this deep. I honestly, I, I mean, I, I began to see it cutting across literally almost every single area of the Christian life. And I'm wondering, ah, this is, this is not, this, I have never seen this like this before, right? And um, the Lord has just, he, he has just blessed me. He has just blessed me. So we know the story about God coming to Eli as a result of what his children did and his actions toward what his children did. As a result of that, he came to meet him and told him that you have honored your sons above me. And as a result of that, the prophecy and the word that came unto you that says that this is going to happen to you, that you are going to be before me forever, be a priest, you know, um, conduct yourself as a priest because Priesthood was a big thing, and it's still a big thing, right? All right, especially in the Old Testament, in the order in which it was. It was a big thing because God separated a full tribe. A full tribe was separated onto priesthood to be able to conduct, you know, the office, to conduct themselves in the office of the priest. But then because of dishonor, God came and says, no, it can't be like that. It can't be like that. How many people know that in the New Testament today, the Bible refers to us in Revelation 5, right, that we are kings and priests. We are kings and priests. It means that if honor was a necessary thing for the priests in the Old Testament, it can't be any less in the New Testament. Are, are we together now? It can't be any less. It's still a very important thing. It's still a very major thing. It's still a very vital thing. To be able to walk with God, to be able to cash in, permit the usage of that word, on the things of the spirit, to be able to line yourself up to the flow of the spirit. There is a flow of the spirit. There is a supply of the spirit. And then what we see here is that God is saying that if you honor me, these things are going to be available to you. I will honor you. It's a big deal if God says I will honor you. It's a big deal when God says that I will. It's a big deal. If a man comes and says, okay, you're going to get the promotion, that's a big deal in and of itself. When God now says, I'm going to honor you, like he said in Psalm 91, he says, I'll deliver him and honor him. It's massive. It's massive. How does God honor us? Several ways, I, I tell you, several ways by which he honors us. When others are getting involved in, in all manner of things, accidents and destruction, and we are exempted from it. It's a function of honor. That's God honoring you. That's God honoring you. That's God, that's God honoring you really. When you have a family that is well put together. Your children growing before you as, as olive plants. Things are in order. There is no shame. There is no ridicule. There is peace. You know, you're not having hypertension. You're not having to visit the hospital every now and then. That's God honoring you. That's God honor. That's the honor of God. That is, to honor means that God will, it's a separation. Honor is a separation. It means that we put value on something. Honor separates the, the holy from the common. Do you know that the opposite for holy is not evil? 
The opposite of holy is common. Because holy means you are separated. Holy means segregated. It means you are holy, you are separate. That's the meaning. That's the base meaning. It means that you are not common. You are not around. We have thought holy is the opposite of evil. But no, it means that you can be a believer and not make the things of God holy. It doesn't, because you've thought that are you holy, you're talking about, you know, unbelievers. Yes, there is a sense in which that is because you are made in the likeness of God, in holiness and in righteousness and true holiness. You see, in Ephesians 4, we see that. I think verse 24. We are made in his likeness in true righteousness. Righteousness and true holiness. So, yes, there is that sense in which as people saved and redeemed of God, we are holy. But there is also the sense in which there are certain things that are holy. How many people grew up in churches where, you know, they have societies and the society, maybe they are doing a societal day and then they'll buy something from the church. And then they will say they are dedicating it. And dedicate it. And we see that in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, a whole lot. Where they dedicate things. God will anoint Bezalel and separate him. What is that? He's holy unto something. When I come, for instance, and say that the only person that can use this is Pastor Tim in this festival. What we have really done to this festival is to separate it and give it a higher value. That's what holy means. So what God did for you in salvation is that he separated you and put honor on you. You see, he made you holy. He made you separate. That is the, that is the, that is the spirit that actually helps us to stay without things like sexual abuse. Some people try to abstain as a result of they are afraid of God. Why will I do this? If your reason for abstaining is because of your wife, it's not a good reason. And I'm not abstaining because I'm married. And that's why whether in marriage or out of marriage, we, we, we need to be separate. I'm abstaining because I am holy. I can't join myself like that. There are some things, for instance, in, in the royal... In, you know, in the royalty of the United Kingdom, there are things that they will say the prince can do, the prince cannot do. You know, if you're, if you're part of this, you cannot go to this place. Cannot. What are they trying to do? Separate. Separate. Hmm. We're still going to revisit this. We are still going to revisit this conversation holy, but this is not my conversation today. I just said I should introduce it to you. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I really want to dig a little deeper on what I've titled honor and spiritual things. Honor and spiritual things. Honor and spiritual things. We've touched on it a little bit, but I feel led. I sense in my heart that we should still look a little bit in, in this direction. Honor and spiritual things. You see, because... Hmm, see, spiritual things are something that take this place. See it as a warehouse, for instance. And see it as where God stores up all manner of supplies that you need. Think of it. Financial provision, promotion, healing, protection, what have you, success, direction. All manner of what you can call spiritual supplies. All manner of spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Think about this auditorium as a warehouse where all of that is stored. Locked. All exits locked. All exits locked. The same way we say about faith. That faith is what brings into reality the supplies of God's kingdom. It brings into reality our spiritual blessings in every place. If you believe, that's why we say things like, be it unto you according to your faith. And so we were able to establish that honor is just like, honor and faith are companions. They're companions. Because where faith is, honor is there. Where faith is, honor is there. We saw from Mark 6, when Jesus went into his hometown, Nazareth. And the Bible says that he went there, I love it in Luke's narrative, much more than any other of the um, writers of the Gospels. Where Luke said he went into to his hometown where he was brought up, 
went into the synagogue as his custom was, and they handed over to him the book you know, of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had found the place he read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, you know, to open the prison doors, you know, the, opening the eyes of the blind and all that, bring recovery to them that are blind and all that, to declare the acceptable day of the Lord. He says, when he had read this, he said unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearings. He said, he closed it, handed it over to the, to the attendant and sat down. And they looked at him that, is this not this guy? I mean, Jesus had gone to other places, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and all the rest, Galilee, and all that. And he had demonstrated this. They had seen his power being demonstrated. They had seen his anointing being demonstrated. You've seen the woman with usual blood, for, for an example. And he came to his hometown. The Bible says he could there do no mighty work. Save he laid hands on a few sickly folks. The Greek brings out that he lays hands on a few people with minor ailments. That means even Jesus could not see himself do it as much as he wanted to. It's very, it's very interesting to the hearing to know that you can limit Jesus in your life. And that Jesus, his power, his glory, is only, will only go as far as your honor lets him. The power, the presence, the anointing, the glory, the supply, the blessing of God can only go as far. People have thought the greatest thing that can hold them back are external things. It's not, it's not true. The greatest hold back to the supply of the spirit is internal. It's called honor. The greatest, listen to this, the greatest hold back, the greatest limitation, they are not the witches in your village. That's not the greatest limitation to the power of God. The greatest limitation to the power of God is not someone that is doing you. Mm -mm. The greatest hindrance to the power of God is you. Is you, your honor, the weight that you place on his hand. So they did not place sufficient weight on Jesus. And the Bible says he could there do no mighty work. He could there do no mighty work. It means that virtue, listen to this, virtue will always go in the direction of value. Did you hear that? The anointing, the grace of God will always go in the direction of value. Take a good example. Ooh, we have a lot of scriptures to read. Lord, help me. Take a good example, the woman with usual blood in Mark 5. From verse 24. He said, when she had heard. One of all had a usual blood, 12 years, da, 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 da. And then he says, when she had heard of Jesus. When she had heard. What did she do as a result of what she heard? She said within herself. When she heard. She said within herself, if I may just touch, what did she hear? What did she hear that made her make that decision? Decision to touch. Are we together? That means whatever she heard must have had something to do with him, his power, his healing, anointing, and all of that. That's what she heard. Because if she had heard that it's, if what she heard was that he was a fine boy, she wouldn't have decided that if I touch his clothes. Faith to be healed does not come from he's a fine boy. If she had heard that he's a very solid carpenter, faith to be healed will not come from he's a good carpenter. She must have heard something about him and she received it just like it is. She received it just like that, putting weight on what she received. So virtue will always go in the line of your value, of your value, of your value, what you put weight on. Some people say it like this, that what you do not esteem, what you do not appreciate, you cannot attract. I'm sure you must have heard that before. That's, what has that got to do? That's value, that honor. What you do not, you see, this principle is a major principle. It's one of the major principles that I learned early in the lines of healing especially. I don't, you know, I hear this, I've heard this quite some. When someone will come and say, my brother is sick, come and pray for him. I don't usually do that. I don't usually do that. Or my uncle is sick, please come and minister to him. I usually don't. You know why? Because I've seen that most of the time it doesn't work. 
You know why? Because you are the one that understands this person's ministry. Oftentimes, I'll tell them, if your brother wants me to pray for him, let him call me. Let him do the calling. I remember someone called. I said, you know, my sister is in an emergency and all of that, you know. And I said, okay, sometimes I oblige, depending on the context. But most times, because sometimes you, you arrive and say, okay, um, I'm calling. I'm so, 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 so. I'm so, 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 so. And then he said, okay. So I, I, I called to pray for him. He said, oh, yeah. okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, that can do nothing. That will not do it. I remember a certain minister also mentioned something like this. Because it's a common thing. You know, he's, he, I've mentioned him here. His name is Keith Moore. Worked with Brother Hagen for a bit, for close to over 20 years. He was, part, he was in charge of healing school at some point. And then he, he, he narrated the fact that he started out doing this. They tell him, you know, my sister is in the hospital. If you could just come around and just pray for her. And he too, you know, with a good heart, will go there and show up. And I'm like, who are you? He said, well, I'm um, Keith Moore. I came to pray for you. He said, okay. Well, go ahead. And he noticed that nine out of ten, it never, it never just happens. Why? Because of the value that they don't have any value. They don't, I don't know you. And sometimes you don't even know if they, if they are in the place to be prayed for. <laughs> so as a general rule, you know why? Because you are the one that understands the ministry of this person. And as a result of you understanding, notice the woman with of blood had to first of all hear. When she heard of him, she now said. When she heard, she now said. When she heard, faith came when she heard. See, that's the same way honor works. Honor is an access card into the supply of the spirit. Let's see something very important and interesting in the book of Genesis. I'm sure you must have come across this a million times. <laughs> but I'll call your attention to it again. Genesis. Genesis 25, 30, 29 to 34. Genesis 25. It's a story of Esau and Jacob. Genesis 25. From verse 29. Hmm. I'm going to show you. See, we're going to see together how, how this is very important. We all know this story. Jacob, Esau. He says, now Jacob cooked a stew. Hmm. And Esau came in from the field and he was weary, was tired. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew. For I'm weary, therefore his name was called Edom, which means red. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Hmm. And Jacob gave his up bran, bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised. Please take note of this word. Despised his birthright. Hebrews. Let's see what the New Testament has to say with that conversation. And then we'll, we'll look at it. Hebrews 12 and verse 16. In this series, we're going to look at a lot of things and open it. Some of these things, we could just read it over and just quote them. But uh, uh, in this, is different here. Now, this, this was in, in the midst of a conversation. It says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for, a, for one muscle of food, sold his birthright. Now, what is the whole big deal here? What is going on here? Because the Bible now calls him profane person. Profane means a godless, in fact, some translations put as a godless person. That is, he's got no esteem for God at all. Why was that? The birthright is not as it is in this day and age. Notice that the Bible is an Eastern book, not, not a Western book. It's not, this is not the background in which the scriptures and was written. This is not the culture. So as a firstborn now, you are just feeling, yeah, what's, what's the bit of a, you are firstborn. No, in fact, firstborn is the one that will now, for Rijago, <laughs> do you understand? He's the one that will now carry the whole thing, try to, you know, and then some people talk about redemption of firstborn. I don't want to go into that. But it suffice to say that there's nothing like that. It's nonsense. 
So the firstborn in this setting means that you are going to be in the lineage. First of all, you are going to get a double of the inheritance every other person gets. So if everybody, if they split the, if you have four children and they split the entire thing, normally you're supposed to split the entire thing into four. But that's not what the firstborn gets. The firstborn gets not one-fourth of it. He gets what? Two over four. He gets double. And why was that? A lot of things around it. But one of the other things that birthright does is that it puts you as the carrier of the blessing. Are we here? He puts you as a carrier of the blessing. That is, you become part of the lineage that leads to Christ. That's what it means here. That means that God has said and said that, look, I'm coming through this lineage. I'm doing something. There is a blessing that comes. And it should, the way we demonstrate it is that you put a double on the inheritance of the first child. So the first one here is not like we see it in this day. It is that you are a progenitor of a covenant. Are we here? That means that, that means that God deemed it fit that the firstborns will be the carriers of his covenant. You will be in the lineage of Christ. That was why it was major when Jacob was now blessing his children, the 12 patriarchs, and he got to Reuben, the first one. He said, Reuben, you are the picture and the demonstration of my strength. You are my first child. You are my strength and my might. And then he said, it shall not be well with you. The double portion didn't go on Reuben. It, even, even, it didn't come on the second and the third. The double portion came on Joseph. You know, there's no tribe of Joseph in Israel. There's no tribe of Joseph. There's only Ephraim and Manasseh. His father adopted his children. He said, this one's their mind. So there is no Joseph tribe. There is the Dan, there's Naphtali, there's Reuben, there's Simeon, there's Levi, there's all of that. But there's not Joseph. Why? He got the double portion. He got the double portion. It's the, it's, so when Esau now said, what is this birthright to me? You know what he was telling God? All this thing I did is nonsense. We were saying concerning, me, concerning double, who double portion help? That was what, you know, people are surprised when they hear many times in the Bible where God said, Esau, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And you're wondering, ah, is that no harsh? Mm -mm, God is God. In his foreknowledge, in his foreknowledge, he had seen the decision making of Jacob. And he had seen the decision making of Esau. And then he says, I love this guy. As much as Jacob seemed to be the wayo guy, the forward night, he said, I love this guy. In the midst of your wayo, you understand spiritual things and you put weight on it. In the midst of the fact that you can be here, you, because how, what comes in for a loaf and then you say, sell me your birthright, you must have been thinking about it. You do not even take one minute. You must have been eyeing that thing. That shows you how important it is. You must have been looking at man. You are privileged. You are privileged. You mean you are going to be part of this? You mean that you are going to be a carrier of the blessing? You mean that you will be in the lineage of God's, you know, seed? You, you, as in what Abraham carried literally is going to come double portion on you. That's heavy. He must have been thinking about it. So the first opportunity that showed up for Jacob to get it, he said, sell me your battery. And you were, you didn't even blink, Esau. You didn't even blink. He said, what is this to me? And so you come into the New Testament and the New Testament will tell you that he was a profane person. What did he do? He profaned the things of God. He looked at the promise of God. He looked at the genealogy. He looked at everything. He looked at the whole salvation package and said it is nonsense. That's what he saw did. That's what he thought did. And as a result of that, God said, what? I, I don't like this. Now, when, when that language hate does not so much mean hate. It means that I prefer Jacob to this. That's a better way to phrase it. I prefer, I prefer this guy. Why? Because of how he treats spiritual things. Because of how he treats spiritual things. Honor will cut will give you access 
into the supply of spiritual things. See, it is not... Let me tell you something. When people honor men of God, for instance, a good example, as an example of the things of God, and honor men of God, it's not so much the fact that maybe they're going to lay hands on you, they're going to speak over you, or they're, it's good, they should, you know, if they're led to, they should speak, they should lay hands if they're led to, and all of that. But it's not so much about that. They are not, they are not the ones in charge of the supply center. They are not the ones in charge of supply. The, they, are not the, they are not the gatekeepers of the supply of the anointing. So really, they don't determine its flow. The flow of the anointing has already been locked in. It opens up to honor and it closes to dishonor, straight up. Even if, you, even if your pastor sees you and says you are blessed, and you have a heart of dishonor, you can't be blessed. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's not about you said this or you didn't say that. No. Notice that Gehazi didn't really need his Elisha to, it's not the pronouncement of Elisha really. His heart already dishonored the things of God. Hence, he could not have the, 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 the double portion. Who would have meant times four of what Elijah carried? He couldn't have. Why? Dishonor. Dishonor. As much as Jacob was Honor opens up access. Honor opens up access. Virtue will always flow in the path of value. It will always flow. It will always flow. It will. Because God is big on honor. He's big on esteem. And so there can be a thousand people in a congregation. Hmm? And I've seen this work. And honor, your esteem for the things of God will get you to access more than some other people. Everybody here can be seated. But how much of virtue flows right from God to every single person is, a, is hinged on how much of honor you put on his things. On how much honor he put on his things. First Thessalonians 2.13. Paul said, when you received the word, you didn't receive it as the word of a man. You didn't receive it as the word of a man. But when you receive the word of God, you didn't receive it from us as the word of a man. He says, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works in you, we believe. We can say in you, we who honor. Who honor the word of God. Who honor the word of God. Honor opens you up. And that's why I said, see, the flow of spiritual things. There is a flow of the spirit. There is a flow of the spirit. The, the, huh. Even the flow of the spirit in services. And that's why you will notice that many times the Holy Spirit moves. When either of two things happen. Number one, when there is regard and esteem. When we are praising God and worshipping him. There is a, he moves faster and better in such atmospheres. Or when the word of God is being exalted. In the preaching of the word. He says, you know, as they went forth preaching the word, walking with them. And confirming the words that they were preaching with signs and wonders. So, so Holy Ghost is the spirit of honor. Because he looks for where honor is to demonstrate himself. Where reverence is. Where awe is. And that's why he demonstrates himself a whole lot when worship is going on. So you see worship is going on and then the spirit of God is moving. The, the manifestation of the spirit of God is moving. You know, things are happening here and there. Things are happening here and there. You know, there's utterance. There's the power gift in manifestation. Even when all of those things, even if there's no word of knowledge, the spirit of God is moving. Word of knowledge simply means word of knowledge. It's not word of sentence. It's not, do you understand? It's not, it's not book of knowledge. That is, among the several things he's doing, he gives you insight into this that and this other one. And he moves better when he magnifies. Notice in John 16, 13. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, it will guide you into all truth. 
He said he will not speak of himself. He will not speak of himself or on his own authority. But what will it happen? Whatsoever he is, that's what he speaks. He will take of what is mine and he will show it to you. All things that the Father had is mine. So therefore I said, he will take of what is mine and show it to you. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Can we have that? It says that no one can say Jesus is Lord. Is that it? No more speaking by the Spirit of God. Call it Jesus a cost. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. This is what it means. The Holy Ghost's intention is to honor the Lord Jesus. And that is why, let me say this. That the move of the Holy Ghost in a meeting is never to confirm the ministry of any, anybody. The Holy Ghost is not set up to confirm any commission or any mandate. He's not here to confirm your anointing. He is there to confirm Jesus. Any gift that points to the man is a gift in corruption. The Holy Ghost never points to a man. They're too small for him to point to. He points to the Lord Jesus. So that's one way to be able to judge manifestation of the Spirit. You go to a place and from start of the message to the end of the message, you're just his prophecy, his move of the Spirit every Sunday. That's how it is. You carry the mic and it's prophesy from a prophet of God. And you prophesy from one person to one person, one person, one person. There is no honor for the word. It's a lie. It's not the Holy Ghost. It's not the Holy Ghost. It's a spirit of divination. What does the Holy Ghost do? He magnifies the word. He doesn't just come to demonstrate. Mm. He comes to magnify the word. He comes to magnify the word. Where there is little or no word and you have a lot of move, there's a problem there. Why do you say so? This is it. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. He said when he comes, he's going to talk about me, about me, about me. If he's not talking about Jesus, he's not, he's not the Holy Ghost. And because that is the JD of the Holy Ghost... It means that whoever honors the word, eh, the only, two cannot work together except they be agreed. Once you magnify the word, it means that you, you are doing what the Holy Ghost wants. So hence, it will help you to do it. It will help you to do it. I've always noticed, check out where you have moved, genuine moves of the spirit is either while they were worshiping or when the word of God is magnified. I see more moves of the Spirit. I have more, more, more manifestations of gifts of the Spirit when either worship is going on or when I get very preachy on the Word and begin to exalt God, begin to exalt the Word and really begin to put out God's Word because the Holy Ghost likes it. He likes it. That's, he will be like, oh, that's it. That's how I love this. A good example is Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, they came to the elders and then they said, this Stephen guy is, is just saying he's blaspheming and all of that. And then they called Stephen and said, oh boy, come now. He said, are these things true? Stephen started from like verse 3 of chapter 7 to like verse 53. He was just reeling out the word. There was a time I read it out. Like, I didn't, was not just reading I was just reading that. I'm like, man... He summarized the whole Old Testament. From Genesis to... He summarized the entire thing. And then I saw in my Bible... Help me look for the verse. Where the Bible says Jesus stood at the right hand of God. I went to read it again. Jesus stood. I did a search for where else Jesus ever stood. Because what we know and what is common, what we see in the scriptures is that he's seated. Everywhere, go check it. He is seated. But this time, go to go to verse 50 something. He stood. He said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing. The day I saw it, I'm like, you know, no, 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 no. Standing? What is he doing standing? I did a search in the entire New Testament, not one other place. Not one. 
I eventually said to myself, I get it, I get it. He preached about the word so much, the word had to give him a, a, a standing ovation. My goodness. That, oh, come on now. Stephen, oh, dare. <laughs> and that's why he could, not, he could not feel those stones. You see, Matthias, many people will look at Matthias and we are afraid for them. To be a Matthias is actually a grace. It's a grace. It's, a, it's an anointing. <laughs> you die by, by the spirit of God. It's not, it's not just that you, you are not feeling for them that they are paying. They didn't. Because it's abnormal for them to be stoning you and it's still abnormal to say forgive them. You can try it. You can just come. We'll not stone you. We'll just look for small, 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 small things in children's church. And let's, we'll just be hitting you. And let's see how much of talk you can do. Yeah, it's, a, it's a grace <laughs> to die for the Lord. It's a grace. Jesus stand. What was, why did Jesus stand? He honored. Stephen honored the word. He exalted the word. Spiritual things. Hey, spiritual things. They flow where there is honor. They flow in the direction of value. 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 That's how it flows. And there will always be a test of this. You will always face the test. You will always face it. Esau faced it. Abraham faced it. A lot of, a lot of talk about the ties. Baba Askuku said, let all of us be quiet about it. That if your pastor wants to call it, give him. If he does not want to keep it. <laughs> right? A lot of talk about the tithe. When the tithe started... There was no law of Moses. Abraham from a spirit of honor. Do you see the way it started from? Look to Melchizedek and said, you know Abraham did not take goods for himself. The king of Sodom came to meet him before Melchizedek. He said, look, just give me, take the goods, give me the people. Abraham said, I've lifted up my hand to the Lord. That I will not even take as much as a shoe latchet. Else you say, you made Abraham rich. I'm looking to the Lord alone. So, Apart from what the guys that went for me, their own share. Once they take their own share, take your thing. And then he took a tenth as well and gave it to Melchizedek. Nobody told Abraham to give Melchizedek anything. Nobody. Whether 10, 15, 20, 25, nobody, nobody. It was out of honor. Out of honor. Out of honor. Out of honor. It always works. Always, always, I've seen it myself. That is also why Jake, Jacob, yes, no, Isaac, before he blessed his children, why did he ask them to go fetch venison? Is it that he didn't have, eventually the one that he ate, where was he from? Was not his house? So it, it wasn't a function of lack. What was it a function of? Honor. It was a test of honor. He said, go find me something. You know why? There's something honor does that opens, it just opens up, it just opens up something onto you. It just gives you the access to it. There's something honor does. And then they went, went to prepare everything. You see, oh, uh, are you getting this? You can't enjoy the flow of the Spirit beyond what you honor. You know, last week I we was talking about how, you know, there are certain things, how you, for instance, dress to church shows a lot of honor. You see, because we want to enjoy God more. We want to enjoy God more. We want to see more of his blessings. We want to see more of his increase. We want to see more of the things of God. See, let me tell you something. The key word there is to honor him. Not just honor him. Because we don't, we don't see him. So the way we know you honor him is how you honor his things. How you honor the gathering together of the saints. In 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel 25, we don't have the time to read it. We see the example of David and Saul. You see, one person that you need to study if you want to know a lot about honor is David. And that was why God also honored him. Because those that honor me, I will honor. Today, still the most celebrated king 
in Israel till date. First Samuel 24. I'm just going to read one or two, a couple of verses there. Because I was, you remember Saul was chasing this man. <laughs> and then verse 2 of second of First Samuel 24 says, Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. Saul took 3,000 men to go and seek one David. One David. And 400 men. Let's even put all these 400 men with him. 3,000. <laughs> and he came to a cave. All right? Verse 4. It says, the men of David said to him, say, oh God, this is the day that the Lord has made. You see, the prophecy that we've been hearing, this is the prophecy. It has been fulfilled. He said to him, behold, the day which the Lord has said unto thee, behold, I will deliver your enemies into your hands, that thou mayest do to him as you seem good unto you. David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe. They told him that this is the prof this prophecy fulfilled. No, there's no need to go around. Just kill him once. So David said, no, 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 no. See what David said. He said to his men, the Lord forbid. The Lord for be that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him. Seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Who is your master? Who is the anointed of the Lord? What do you mean? If it was some of us in that scenario, as I tell us, this is the day the Lord has made. You look and say, Benny, you, you, you said it right. This is the day. Today, this guy goes down to rise no more. You look in chapter 26, you see the exact same thing happened there. His commander told him that, Oga, let me strike. If I strike, I will not miss. Just once. If I do it once, I won't miss. He said, no, no, no. He said, how will you heal the anointed of the Lord and be guiltless? The person that was chasing you with 3,000 men, even the sketch of Esau that he started, of, of Saul that he tore, the Bible says his heart troubled him. How, how will I do this? How will I do this? That's someone that honors the things of God. He was bringing back the ark. I think in 1 Samuel 3. From, the, from, from, from um, where was that now? And then while that was going on, things happened. And then they put the ark in the house of Obededom. After a while of three months, they told him Obededom had prospered because of the ark. So he went to fetch the ark. The Bible says at six, every six paces. He dropped the ark and he worshipped. Every six paces, he dropped the ark and he worshipped. What kind of thing is that? Every six, he will create an altar, do burnt sacrifice, and he will. And that's why they call David. We 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 say that David also was a priest because the Bible says that he wore a linen effort and he offered sacrifices. You don't do that except to a priest. You see. He did that. What was David doing? He was honoring God. He was honoring God. He was honoring God. Honor will help us have a greater measure of the spirit in manifestation. It will. Honor will help us in your private life. Honor will help the things of the spirit to open up unto you. Honor will help you see the things of the Spirit even more, experience it even more. It will help you to be able to enjoy the things of God. You see, because when you put weight on the things of God, there's no how that you will not get the benefit. He said, I will honor them that honor me. And those that despise me, I will lightly esteem. That is, if you honor God, God too will put your things serious. If you don't honor his things, he will lightly esteem your things too. It will likely esteem your things. This is important. We say, we saw, there are several examples. Several examples. Matthew 26, 6 to 13. The woman with the alabaster box. She came to meet him, broke the oil. What was that? That was honor. That was honor. She didn't know her name was even going to enter into the Bible. But because of what she did. And then right in the midst of that, we also see Jude, Judas. Say that this thing shouldn't have been. Never be caught saying that it's too much for God. 
Never be caught saying that. Never be caught with that mindset that is too much. Never be caught with that mindset. Luke 19, let's look at that as well. Luke 19, 28. Luke 19, 28. I just want us to see these instances. I'm just emphasizing the same thing today. Luke 19, 28. This is important for us to see. It's very important. It says, after Jesus has said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. We know this. They went to untie the, the, the donkey, came to meet him. Then verse 32, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners replied, you know, who is the, what, do you, what do you want and all that. Um, verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to Mount Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Glory in the earth. Imagine what that was. A court no man had ever sat on. They put Jesus on it. And then they went, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They were shouting. See, that is how we ought to treat the presence of God. That is how we ought to treat it. When we come to church, that's not the time to be quiet. That's the time to lift your voice and say glory to God. That's the time to demonstrate it, to say it, to rejoice. You know why? It's you showing honor. It's you showing honor. Let's continue there. He says, oh. <laughs> some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd. I said, teacher, rebuke us all this. Rebuke your disciples. <laughs> no wonder they were Pharisees. And no wonder they did not know the things of God. But continue. And he answered them and said, I tell you the truth. If this one should keep quiet, immediately the stones will cry out. And he said, continue, verse 42. If only, verse 42. He says, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. He says, but now they are hidden from your eyes. They are hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you, 43, when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming. Why didn't they recognize it? They dishonored him. Why else everybody was praising him, spreading clothes, spreading palms on the ground, receiving him with honor? Then they were like, what's this? What is this going what was what? Why are you shouting this much? Have you ever been have that that, that thing? Why are you, what is the essence? What is going on? Why are you people just glad? He, we ought to. He made us glad. He made us glad, and he's the king of kings. He's not just any kind of man. He's not. No, he's not. Jesus said, "You people did not know the things that are meant for your peace. You did not know the day of your visitation. Why? Dishonor didn't allow them." Dishonor didn't allow them. I'll share this with you and then I'll end it here. I remember one of the stories I heard one time from Brother Hagen about how he, there was a very committed person in his church. One, I think one of his Sunday school, when he was still pastor, one of his Sunday school people. And he noticed that like two or three times, right, two or three times consecutively, he will, they will call for him because their children will be sick, right? They will call for him. Are we still together? They will call for him and then they will, he will come to the house, you know, knock the door, you know, eventually they will open and they're like, what was going on? He will pray for the children. But he notices that the children, sometimes they don't even get healed or they take a while before they get healed. There was this other person who wasn't necessarily committed to his church like that. He wasn't really, but then the same exact thing will play out. She will call him. He will go to her house. Pray for her children. And almost immediately at the snap of a finger, they always get healed. The thing bothered him for a long time. 
what was bothering him that why why is this because if anybody's children are supposed to get healed it's supposed to be this woman who comes to church gives to church committed Sunday school teacher how come that doesn't happen he said he thought about it for a while and suddenly like a TV screen appeared into his house in, in, his, in front of him. He said he saw the entire thing play out, right? Exactly what, he, what happened. He saw it play out and then God now emphasized to him that, did you notice that every time you went to this committed woman's house to pray for her children, that you always have to knock, 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 knock. Sometimes you have to go behind, look for them before they not come. Yo, oh, you are welcome. So these children, I don't know why they fall sick. He saw everything play out. I don't know why they fall sick, but hopefully you can pray for them and hopefully they'll get healed. And then God emphasizing that you, you see why she doesn't get healed. This is that's why. Play the exact same thing to the other woman. And how that from afar, before he even gets to the door, she's already out there. Oh, thank you for coming. Receives him to the house. I don't know why, but I know that once you pray for them, they will be healed. That's the exact same statement. And then God showed him the difference is honor, it's simple. Is honor and faith. Notice when Peter came to the house of Cornelius. Did you notice that Cornelius had already prepared the ground? Called his household, called everybody. When Peter was afar off, he came to meet Peter, bowed to Peter. It was Peter that said, No, 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 we are all men. What is you don't need to do all of that? By the time Peter got there. Even the Holy Ghost could not wait for Peter to finish talking. While he was speaking, the Holy Ghost fell. What was that? There was honor. How did it show up? Preparation. Now you receive it. I know that there could be extremes nowadays in people they find ministers and some things and all of that. Yes, I know there's, there's that. But some in some other claims, in order not to defy some people, we've now gone to the other extreme to commonize the things of God. In order not to now say, okay, let's balance it. We've now gone to an extreme where there is now no, there is no difference. There's no difference. There's no difference between, between what is common and what is what is holy. There's no difference between what, you know, sometimes. And this will challenge you too. This is another table I want to break. When it comes to tongues mm, and comedy, a number of people are, 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 are guilty of this. And I stopped it a long time ago. I don't even think I, I ever did it much. You're having comedy and there's one name that will fly around in your head now. And you use tongues as a means of gesticulation. And you are there watching it. Ah. the instrument I used to connect to my father you commonize it like this and you are cool and you will laugh you will see people do comedy of how a pastor comes and is casting on demon for, for, for hours and demon to his fighting and you are there you are laughing they are commonizing the things that you hold in high esteem <laughs> and you are party to it and you're wondering why when you're speaking in tongues he's not giving you that much reward. You've commonized it. You can't joke with it on one hand and in the next minute you flip and then you want to use that as a supernatural means of talking to your father. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. He's separate. He's separate. He's separate. We also don't talk about ministers. We don't judge people. Now, yes, we can judge prophecy. We should judge prophecy. The Bible tells us who judge prophecy. We can judge doctrine and teachings. Yes, we can. We can judge the spirit behind the thing. You should judge it. If someone comes and blasphemes, no, that's not correct. You should say that. And if you have friends around you, you should tell them that is not true. But not the man. Leave the man. Leave the man alone. We were never authorized to judge any man. Any man. We are not authorized to do that. We are not authorized to do that. We are not. Most of ministers of the gospel, we are not authorized to do that. 
I can draw the spirit of a thing. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, to what? Test all things. Verse 20, 22, there about. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is true. So you can test. How do you test? You test with the word. You test with your heart. With the Holy Ghost in your heart. How is your heart receiving it? And you judge it. No, this is wrong. A prophecy comes out. The Bible says to judge prophecies. So let two or three prophesy. Let the others judge. So we can tell. No, that prophecy is no, 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 no. We don't believe that's of God. We can. How do we know? You judge by the word. Someone comes out and says that there is, there is, you know, there are sinners. You know, they love, that used to be common. There are sinners in this church. Everybody has sinned. Nobody is righteous. You are all going to hell. No, that's not God. God don't speak like that. God does not speak like that. He does not speak like that. He does not speak like that. He does not speak like that. How does it, why do I know that? God doesn't edify anybody. All the prophecy you get in your church, everybody leaves with his head down. They are worse off. It will have been better for them not to come to church. Because now that they've come to church, their faith has been withered down. No, God doesn't do that. Even when he corrects, he corrects with grace. He corrects with faith, not fear. He corrects, and you, when he corrects you, it's not condemnation, no. No. When the spirit of truth comes, he will convict the world. Convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not in me. And that is for the unbelievers. Of righteousness because I go to my father. What does that mean? That means that as a son, when you have the spirit of God, what he convicts you of is to tell you, you are the righteousness of God. You can't do this. He convicts you of the righteousness. He doesn't, con he doesn't condemn you. He doesn't condemn you. He tells, no, you don't, he, this is who you are. He shows you who you are. In seeing who you are, you correct who you are, what you are doing that is not right. So I said that to say, you can judge prophecy. You can judge doctrine. You can judge teaching. You don't judge ministers. You don't judge ministers. You don't judge ministers. There was a time there was a scene that was going on in Brother Higgins' time. A, the, there was a particular minister that had done something sexual, I think. I think there was sexual stuff. And then they came together, put a, you know, said a few things about it. A minister who wasn't in the meeting called Kenneth Higgins. I said, what did they say about this thing? And then he said what they said. He was about to sleep that night, put up his light. Immediately put up his light. He said he saw a bright light just shine into his room. And the Lord told, said from that bright light. He said, who art thou that condemns another man's servant? Immediately he knew what he was talking about. He said, I didn't condemn your servant. I didn't condemn him. Jesus said again, who art thou that condemns another man's servant? He said, I didn't condemn him now. I just told this man exactly what we said in the meeting. I, I'm not the one. I didn't condemn him. He said it the third time, who art thou that condemns another man's servant? He says, I didn't condemn your servant. And then he asked him, whose servant is he? But then he said, he replied, if he's any man's servant, he's your servant. That is, I cannot have any servant like that guy. He's doing that kind of nonsense. <laughs> he said, and God replied to him that if he's my servant, then leave him alone. I'm able to make him stand. Leave him alone. Have you noticed that the people that they talk against a lot, eventually, they just, they will just blow. Have you noticed that? You think, think, think. Everybody that they've condemned throws stones at, as you're throwing stones at them, it seems that's when God will not feel, ah, they are throwing stones at you, I love this. So that they can take all the glory, he will now beautify them like nothing, like, <laughs> he will beautify them so much. Think about it, think about it. We keep the heart gentle. We keep our honor in, at a tiptoe condition. At a tiptoe condition. We should always. You see, when you do that, you will begin to see the difference. Because God has said in himself that I will honor them that honor me. Them that honor me. Father, we give you thanks for your word that always comes in truth, in faith in simplicity thank you because indeed you honor us as we reverence you as we pay attention to give you the praise to honor you to stand in awe and in reverence of you thank you because indeed we'll see that honor play out also in our lives 
Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we say amen to that? Glory to God.